I'm Peter Melville from Hevra, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the way the vehicle communicates with the charging equipment. So, um, if we take one of these, most people will probably identify this as a charger for an electric vehicle, and you're not really correct because the charger is actually in the vehicle and it's carried around all the time. And the technical term for this is the supply equipment. So, um, we've got a three pin plug on one end. We've got a plug to fix the vehicle on the other end, and then we've got a box in the middle. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens in that box and why we need it. So, um, so the reason this is called the supply equipment rather than the charger is because this literally just supplies the car with uh, mains voltage. So um, the conversion into DC and getting the suitable voltage to charge the battery is all done within the vehicle, and uh, this just provides us with a safe interface between the vehicle and the mains. So, um, inside this box, we have a couple of relays, and they literally just connect up the live and neutral as required, so we can get some lives on this socket. And under normal circumstances, none of these have any power on them at all, which obviously makes it nice and safe. So, um, we've got various wires on here, so this has got sufficient um, connections for three phase charging, even though this is only single phase. Um, so most of them won't be used on here. Um, but the middle one is an earth. So when we talk about an earth in terms of electric vehicle, obviously we've got our vehicle earth, i.e. the body of the car, and we've also got our mains earth. Now when we're talking about electric vehicles, they are the same thing, because as soon as we plug the vehicle in, um, our earth connection from the mains is joined to the body of the car. So um, just to demonstrate that, if I set my meter to continuity, and I just go from the earth pin to the charging socket. We've got continuity to the uh, metal parts of the car. So that's what our earth pin does. And <coughs> then on our single phase, we've got a live and neutral. And you'll see um, we've got these two little pins at the top, which are for, for our control. So um, we've got what we call a proximity pilot, which just tells the car it's plugged in. When that's plugged in, it won't let the car start and drive off because obviously we'll be dragging the house down the road with us. And we've also got a control pilot. And the control pilot is what convinces this box there's a car on the end and therefore it's safe to turn on the supply. And it also lets the car know how much power it's allowed to pull from the mains without blowing the fuses and shorting everything out. So um, that's obviously quite important. So um, first of all, I'm going to plug this in. And uh, we've then got a bit of information on our little screen. So we've got 240 volts coming out of the mains. And then what we will actually have on our control pilot, which is what we're going to look at today, um, is we have 12 volts coming out of the cable. And then when we plug that into the car, it will then have a resistor in the car that's permanently connected that pulls that down to about 9 volts. And then when the car is ready to charge, it will then pull it down to six volts. Um, so in order to make sure that it's completely safe, because in theory we could dangle that into a puddle and um, it could obviously cause a voltage drop across those pins and it could think there's a car on the end, we also have a um, diode in there. So what it's looking for is it's looking for a voltage drop on the positive half of the waveform but not on the negative part of the waveform, and that's how it knows it's a car rather than a puddle that it's plugged into. So we'll show you all that once we've, once we've plugged it in. Um, so the first thing that we need to have is we need to have 12 volts on this control pilot, which we can't measure at the car end, because as soon as we make contact with the car, the car's resistor is going to pull that down to 9 volts. So the only way we can ever see that 12 volts is to measure it directly on the cable. So we've got 12.2 volts on there, so that's fine. And then I've got this connected up to the control pilot wire. I've actually connected it up at, at the other end of that wire because it's easier to get to. And then um, my other wire is joined to earth, which as previously mentioned is the earth from the wall and the earth on the car because as soon as we're plugged in it's the same thing. So what I'll do is I'll plug it in, we'll have a bit of a look at what voltage we've got on that wire using the oscilloscope, and then we'll talk about why we get that voltage and how it works. 
So I'm going to plug it in. And the car's realised it's plugged in because the lights come on and it's locked in the cable. And we're starting to see something happening on here. And it's now started charging. So I'll just pause that. And then we'll talk about what we're getting on here. You can just hear the car making a very delicate buzzing sound as it starts to charge. So if I just go back a couple of screens. The first thing we've got is our 12 volts. Now I've got 12 volts on that wire here. Obviously we can't see it because this is before we plugged it in. So you'll have to take my word for it. We saw it with the meter. At this point we've got 12 volts on the charging socket. Now this was the point where we plugged the charging cable into the vehicle. And of course because we've got that permanently connected resistor that immediately pulls the voltage down from 12 to 9 volts. So um, we'll just measure that voltage using one of the rulers on the oscilloscope. So there we go, we're getting about 8.9 volts at that point, so that's as soon as we're connected. Um, now the next thing the um, supply equipment is going to do is it's then going to start sending a signal down the same wire to let the car know how much power it's allowed to take. So that is what you see at this point here. Now sometimes the car will say it's ready to charge first, and then the cable will say it's ready to charge and you're allowed X number of amps. Sometimes it'll happen the other way around, and it doesn't really matter which way it happens. All that we know is once both sides are ready, it will then start to charge. Now, in the case of the Renault Zoe, um, because um, it doesn't have a transformer within the charging circuit, it needs to do some extra ground checks to make sure it's safe. So the charging handshake is longer than for most vehicles. So um, with these, it will always be the... Um, charging cable that's ready before the car. In other cars, it'll be the car that's ready before the cable, but it doesn't really matter as long as we eventually reach the point where both are ready. So, um, the first thing we have here I'm plugging in is that our voltage has dropped to nine volts. And then you can just see there's a big blob of blue here, so we're gonna have to zoom in to get a bit more detail on that. Um, so if I just use the zooming in tool, What you'll see, in fact I'm going to zoom in even further so we can see that a bit more clearly. If we zoom in, we can see we've still got our 9 volts at the top. We've got minus 9 volts down here. And what we're doing is you can see we've got a pulse width. Now that is letting the cable know how much power it's allowed to take from the mains. So this is a very important part of the handshake because we want the car to charge as fast as we possibly can using the available current, but equally we don't want to more, pull more current from the wall when we're allowed. So um, if we uh, then measure this signal, so I'm just going to pull these rulers along so it coincides with the start of one pulse and the start of the next. The difference between those, we've got one millisecond, so every one millisecond it's sending a pulse, and you can see that it changes the on and off time to um, let the vehicle know the current it's allowed to pull from the mains. So, um, the most you'll ever get off a 3-pin plug is 10 amps, because that's considered, although a 3-pin plug will provide 13 amps for a kettle or something like that, when you've got it on charge for several hours, it's agreed that 10 amps is, is suitably safe to be on. Um, for several hours, and um, if you're plugged into a proper charging point, then obviously this will be um, the current rating sent to the car will depend on what that is, is programmed to, depending on what the breaker is set to, um, as to what current it's allowed to put out the fuse box. So um, this is also continuously variable, so um, with a basic lead like this it won't, but under some setups it can actually change this during the charge and the car will change the amount of current it's pulling out of the wall accordingly. So, um, for example, uh, on my own house, my own charging point, uh, I have solar panels on my roof, and if I'm not in a rush to use the car, I can set the charging point to only use the power from the solar panels. So my charging point measures the power that's coming off the solar panels and would be being lost back into the grid, and instead, it calculates the duty cycle to get that exact amount of current into the car and it will vary this. And then, if I'm in my house and I turn the kettle on, obviously that reduces the solar output and it can change this accordingly and the car will pull less current. And equally, if a, if a cloud comes over, that reduces the solar output 
and we can then tell the car to take less current. So um, this figure is, is quite important when we have um, things like cars that won't charge at the right speed. We can see, well, what actually speed is the um, charger allowing the car to pull for the wall? And then very quickly we can say, is it a problem with the vehicle or is it a problem with the supply equipment? So um, this is what we see and this communication will be continued the entire length of the charge as to how many uh, amps it's allowed to pull. And if I just zoom back out, and we'll move forward a little bit. So during this point, the um, supply equipment was ready to charge and the vehicle wasn't. Now when the vehicle is happy that it's done all the checks and it's got no problems and it is ready to charge, it will then connect another relay that will then pull this voltage down further. The supply equipment then recognises that voltage drop and it will then turn on the relays and we will then have our mains voltage on this cable. So it keeps it completely safe and um, for the reasons we've mentioned it, it can't overload what it's allowed to take from the wall. So if we just come forward a little bit, this is all the point where it's doing its checks to make sure it's happy. And you'll see at this point here, we can see a further voltage drop. And um, this is then the vehicle saying, yep, yeah, I'm happy with everything, I'm ready to charge, please can you turn on the supply? So we see that voltage drop from nine volts and measure this, I'll just pull this ruler down, then that should be about 6 volts and it's, we're getting about 5.8 so we're, we're um, about right with our 6 volts. But what you'll notice with our waveform, which was previously switching from 9 volts to minus 9 volts, we've now pulled this voltage down and we're now switching from, minus, from 6 volts on the positive side, but we're still going to minus 9 volts on the negative side. And this is an important safety feature. So what this is for is um, if we were to see that same voltage drop on both sides, potentially that could be caused by a puddle or, or something else that was, was uh, pulling the voltage down on that wire. Whereas by only affecting half the waveform, that has to be a semiconductor device doing that. In this case, it's a diode that only affects one half of the waveform because it only allows that current to flow in one direction. And uh, this then um, allows the supply equipment to say, yes, that is definitely a car on the end. It's not just um, a bit of mud or a puddle or something else that might inadvertently turn it on. So at this point here, it will then turn on the supply and the vehicle can start drawing current and charging. ZF Technical Training offers various courses, including all training courses in the ZF product portfolio and also e-mobility courses too. The customised ZF training programme explicitly addresses the requirements and issues of electric mobility. From R&D and production to workshops, this qualification is required in order to be allowed to work on high voltage systems. Our focus is on offering all the qualifications you will need. Our training is characterised especially by its practicality, combined with the efficient transfer of knowledge. The training is very good, with practical examples of working on vehicles and key components, things we can really work with in case of emergency. It's particularly exciting to train with work processes that you've never used before. It is really something new and special. The special feature about our training is modularization, which makes a high degree of individualization possible for participants. Our goal? To enable them to start the learning path depending on their level of knowledge. We offer e-learnings that can be worked through at an individual's own pace, independent of time and place, that still meet all the local legal requirements by providing very intensive practical learnings. Small group, which is great. Everyone gets a turn and no one is forgotten. And you can't cheat your way through. Everyone is taken on board and no one is excluded. There's a lot of interaction and discussion and it's very open too. I think it's good that you are challenged. Nothing is straightforward. Plus, there's room to discuss things professionally. 
We've set up various stations that should enable the participants to directly practice what they have learnt here in this course. As always, I am very pleasantly surprised by ZF. I think it's up to date and a mixture of everything, the practical part as well as the e-learning and the theoretical. The learning materials are of course excellent. All round, it's a very conclusive programme. We've worked out a lot ourselves, which always gives us the certainty that we are practically trained. The training takes place here in our ZF headquarters, but we're also very mobile and can take equipment to other locations when required. Not only that, we also train other renowned automotive manufacturers too. Even universities are asking whether their students can learn the qualification in advance with us, because the demand is so high. I'm glad that F is taking this path so energetically, and that I can be a part of it. It's important to keep learning. Different sections. The first one is ADAS and, and how does it work. We're going to look at when we should calibrate and, and give us that information. If we do have to calibrate and there is evidence required, then what sort of evidence do you have to give to the customer and what sort of evidence are you expected to keep as, um, in your own records as a workshop? And then we're going to concentrate a little bit on the consequences of not calibrating. The, the idea of this training session is to empower you as, as uh, whether you're a technician or a centre manager that deals with these vehicles with ADAS systems fitted and they can have different varying levels of capability, is empowering you to be able to deal with those customers to decide whether they need a calibration and how to pass that information over to the customer um, to persuade them to calibrate uh, if they do require a calibration and if the job that you've done requires a calibration. And sometimes telling them the consequences of not calibrating, not in a scary way, but in a, in a realistic way, is, is a great way of doing that. So we're going to look at, if you didn't calibrate it, what's the, the kind of things that the customer would actually notice, really. So these, this training session is going to cover these four different sections. Um, and if you have got any questions at a later date, you can feed back, that back through, uh, and we will try and answer any questions that you may have. So if we begin first about ADAS and what is it and how does it work? Well, ADAS is there um, to almost protect both driver, passenger, and the vehicles and pedestrians around it from being in any type of accidents or being hurt in any way. And it does this by using a number of different sensors around the vehicle of different types, which we'll touch on, um, and a number of other different safety systems that all kind of gel together in, an, in essence, to try and keep everybody as safe as possible and reduce any road accidents. It can also make it just a more comfortable drive for the driver. So rather than purely being focused on safety, it is also able, enabling us to have a, a smoother driving experience. Now, ADAS itself, the acronym, stands for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, and it covers, covers a various number of sensors and actuators, which we'll touch on a bit later. What I first want to talk you through is the different levels of ADAS systems available. Now, the Society for Automotive Engineers, the SAE, have kind of graded the capability of each ADAS system where it fits into one of five categories. And what we'll do is we'll just touch on those categories before we carry on and, and carry on any further. So these categories fall into level one to five. A level one system is where the driver can have assistance at the wheel but at all times they must have their hands on the wheel. The system can also operate the brakes or accelerator independently as well. So an example of this system would be a car that has adaptive cruise control. We'll touch on a little bit more about how that works, but that is a cruise control system that monitors its vehicle surroundings and adjusts the speed. So if you're on a motorway doing 70 miles per hour and you're approaching another vehicle in front of you doing 60 miles per hour, the vehicle will automatically slow down and stay behind that. And unlike a standard cruise system that would just continue at that speed unless the driver acts, um, the cruise control system will act and keep you safe 
at a safe distance away from that vehicle. So level one can do the accelerator and brakes like adaptive cruise control, and it can either warn or assist you when it comes to the steering. So that means that it could give you some sort of warning buzzer, vibration, or it can help actually move the steering wheel uh, to keep you safe as well. Where level one differs to level two is that level two allows you to do hands off driving. So this means that at, whether it's a motorway or dual carriageway, that you are allowed to release your hands from the wheel. And this time the ADAS system will control the accelerator and the braking system, but it will also control all the steering system. Now, an acronym or a word you may have heard of, sorry, is geofencing. The word geofencing means that the manufacturers can use the ADAS systems, but rather than have them operate the same everywhere, doesn't matter what road that you are, they can tie directly into the satellite navigation and mean that functions only work on certain types of road. So we could have a, a, a vehicle that was level two capable and the manufacturer geofences it so it only works when the vehicle is on a motorway. So when the vehicle's on a motorway, the GPS system knows what road it's on. The, it's then compared to a map and the map says this is a major road, whether that be a dual carriageway or motorway. And at this point, we will now allow level two features to be engaged. As soon as you were to leave a motorway and go onto a country lane or a local road at sort of 30, 40 miles an hour, the GPS knows that you're no longer on that major road and it will not let you activate a level two um, system. It may then revert to level one or potentially nothing at all. So manufacturers can not just have the ADAS system, they can choose to activate it depending on what road that you're on. So level two allows for hands-off driving, but the at this point, the driver, and it's in the regulation, must be prepared to take over at a moment's notice. So because of this, a vehicle with level two may also have a camera facing the driver and it will watch that their eyes are still looking at the road. If the driver then looks around, possibly not looking at the road for a number of seconds, the system will then begin to issue warnings um, and, and go further from there. So level two is hands off. So the, steer, the car can steer on its own. It can accelerate and can, can brake, but the driver must be able to take over in a moment's notice. So the system isn't really designed to handle particularly complex things. So the driver is literally given a beep and said, take over now. Where level three differs is level three can be eyes off. So level three means that you don't have to be looking at the road at all times. The system is more competent and it can even deal with issues that are going on in, in front of the vehicle. With a level three vehicle, it will do the steering and the accelerator and the brakes. But it, should it detect something it doesn't know what to do, it must be able to deal with it for up to 10 seconds until the driver can take back control. So this may be the case where you're driving down the motorway, the system is active in level three mode, and there is an accident in front. It must be able to keep the passenger safe and give you a countdown of up to around 10 seconds as we go nine, eight, seven, and it's warning the driver, you need to take back control five, four, three, two, and you need to take back control now. So because of that, it means that the, the driver can be eyes off. Level four capability is mind off. That means that the system can be pretty much autonomous, but again, the manufacturer can choose to geofence the capability. So it may be that we can be level four on all motorways, major roads and major cities, but in some country lanes or roads without markings, the, it, the vehicle will ask you to take over. So again, we geofence the function so it only works in certain areas and then I compare that data to a map as well. And level five is completely autonomous and it does not require a wheel. Again, this may only operate in certain areas, but the dry, the, the everybody in the vehicle is simply a passenger in it. We program the destination within the satellite navigation uh, and, and the vehicle takes you there. 
Now, a lot of times we get asked, well, at what point, where are we today? And this is 2020. And where are we heading? Well, today there are many vehicles on the road uh, already that have level two, three, and even four standards. But at the moment, regulations uh, where we stand today prevent any vehicle from being higher than a level one as a production vehicle. So they can actually be like 1.9999, so they can pretty much do everything. However, their hands must be on the steering wheel. In 2021, the UK government is looking at a scheme to trial level two systems. Um, and we'll, we'll mention that in a little bit more detail later. Um, but you cannot have your hands off the wheel at the moment. So really they are exactly what it says on the tin. They're assistant systems where they can assist you with driving, but they are not to be 100% relied on. Um, that's not until we get to level three, four and five that are allowed on the road as a production vehicle. So we've mentioned a little bit about the vehicle can either do this, even at level one and level two, they can still do some steering action or warnings. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So the systems will generally come in one of three standards. The first standard will be simple lane departure warning. So what the vehicle does, the camera on the vehicle monitors the road ahead, and you can see the red dotted lines are the parameters that the vehicle cannot drift past without issuing a warning. So as the driver, if you lapse in concentration, fall asleep or fall ill at the steering wheel, the car will begin to drift to the edge of the lane. When the vehicle reaches the edge of the lane, it will issue an audible warning. It may issue a haptic warning of vibration, either in the steering wheel or the seat, or it may issue both depending on the vehicle. And we call that lane departure warning. There is no steering action taken. It is a simple warning system. Moving on from that is very much the same. However, this time with lane assist, the vehicle, when you approach the edge of the lane and you haven't indicated, so you haven't indicated to say you're going to change lane, so you begin to drift to the edge, the system assumes that you are not necessarily in full control and it will actually apply torque to the steering wheel and the ADAS system will turn the steering wheel and pull you back into the lane. Now, people often ask, well, how do I actually change lanes then without that happening? On most vehicles, when you operate the indicator that temporarily disables the system, allows you to change lanes. When you take the indicator off, the lane assist reactivates. Now, the, we can take this one step further. So we can go from lane departure to lane assist, and then we can go right through to what's called adaptive lane guidance, or it can be called lane keep assist. The major difference with this system is the parameters change and they're far narrower. So rather than waiting for you to drift to the very edge of the lane, the system will attempt to keep you in the center of the lane at all times. Now, if you were to remove your hands from the steering wheel, then the system would continue to keep you within your lane. But after between 10 and 30 seconds, depending on the car, it would begin to give you some warnings about you now need to retake control of the vehicle. You need to put your hands back on the steering wheel. So the system is constantly monitoring all of the driver inputs to make sure that you've got your hands on the steering wheel. And this is the system that in 2021 that the UK government wished to trial, allow manufacturers to trial um, so they can operate and work correctly on UK motorways at, at, at the beginning. So those are the three levels of steering. Warning, lane assist, which provides correction if you reach the edge of the lane, and adaptive lane guidance, which is designed to keep you in the dead center of your lane at all times. So that's a little bit about steering. I wanna mention now a little bit about, we talked about adaptive cruise control. So adaptive cruise control normally uses a radar or radars, there can be two or even three, depending on the, the vehicle. And that radar sends a beam out to check what's going on uh, ahead of the vehicle. So what this means is as the vehicle is accelerating and the cruise control is set, rather than running directly into the back of the vehicle, the radar beam will allow the ADAS system to see that vehicle and begin to slow down and match the speed to the vehicle ahead. Of course, if you decide to overtake, then it'll resume back up to your maximum set speed. 
So if you set it at 70 miles an hour, it will always take you up to 70 mile an hour, but no quicker than that. If there's a vehicle in front, it then simply slows you down. A great system and it really makes driving long distances um, much more pleasurable, enjoyable and far less, um, less fatigue on the driver. Now, whether it's adaptive lane guidance, lane assist, adaptive cruise control, these ADAS systems traditionally are using one of the components or more, which you see on screen now. So we can have in the top left a front radar and we may have more than one of them. We also use parking sensors at the front, at the rear and at the sides of the bumpers. Um, and these are much shorter range, traditionally somewhere between five and 10 meter range on a parking sensor. We can use a front facing camera or cameras. Um, currently the, 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 the most cameras you have in the front window of a vehicle is three, um, but that may change with time. We also use radars, not just in the front, um, but behind the rear bumpers. And these radars are there to operate what we call blind spot warning. So when a vehicle approaches you and is overtaking and it sits in the blind spot where you may not be able to see it in the mirror, the, there is often a little light in the mirror and that will illuminate when a vehicle is in the passing lane overtaking you. And that is it's detected by the rear facing radars um, to detect anything in the blind spot. It simply illuminates when the vehicle has passed, the light goes out, and it's just there to give you that extra level of protection. We also have side cameras, and these are often used for parking assistance. So the cameras can either be in the wings or most commonly they're in the, um, they're in the side mirrors. And they have a fisheye lens on them, allowing them to look at around about 150 degrees viewing angle. And again, just used to help for people for parking or it may be part of a system that automatically parks the vehicle. Now, you may not have heard of LIDAR. So LIDAR is an alternative to radar. So radar stands for radio distance and ranging, and LIDAR stands for light distance and ranging. There are some advantages to using LIDAR instead of radar, and there are one or two high-end vehicles that actually use both. LIDAR gives you more accurate information about what's in front. It can map the terrain and the vehicles ahead with more accuracy, but it can be affected by sunlight and poor weather. Radar can map what's ahead, but it's not so accurate, but it isn't generally affected by sun or, or rain. So both have their advantages. Finally, the steering angle sensor is monitored at all times. So if there is an issue on wheel alignment and the steering the physical steering wheel is off at the incorrect angle, but the vehicle camera sees that the road ahead is straight, then we can cause an error from that as well. So these different components on screen are what make up an ADAS system and allow the vehicle to determine what's around you and what's safe. Now I'm gonna show you this example here. We're on board a Tesla Model 3, and this is the center display screen where the speedo and the radio is all displayed. Now, the reason we're showing you Tesla is because Tesla have what is called a driver visualization display. And all Teslas have this. And it simply shows you what the ADAS system is seeing. Many other, fact, many other manufacturers, they have this. The ADAS systems operate in a similar way. They just don't display what's happening on screen. So this particular Tesla has eight cameras around the vehicle, it has three in the windscreen. It has two cameras on each side and finally a camera at the rear view. What we're looking at on the left is the rear view camera and at the bottom of the left of the screen you can see the two side cameras which are in the wings. Now in the center of the screen you'll see where it says under 58 miles per hour that is the driver visualization display. So I can see from this visualization display that there are vehicles around me and those vehicles actually move in real time. So as we overtake the truck, which you can see both in the camera and driver visualization display, that truck will physically move around us. Now you can see this vehicle currently has adaptive lane guidance activated. And we can tell that by two things. Number one, there are two blue lines in the lane. That means that this vehicle is locked onto the lane and that's fairly common practice to have that sort of display. Secondly, we can see that there is a little blue steering wheel icon that is got a blue circle around it, and that means the system is active. 
When the system is disabled, the blue circle disappears and there is a warning sound to, to inform the driver that the system is no longer active. So in the middle, that's it operating on a motorway, as you can see in the picture. And on the right hand side, that's the driver visualization operating on a, uh, not a motorway, a dual carriageway. So you can see here that we can also detect speed limit signs. So the speed limit the signs are displayed on screen and this just helps the driver uh, understand what the speed limit is with the row that they're given on. So on the right hand side picture, the system isn't active. There is no adaptive lane guidance or lane assist active. It's simply monitoring the surroundings around the driver. Now, one thing that has really improved with the introduction of ADAS and the ADAS components is lighting. So if we think of a traditional vehicle and we pointed it against a wall in a dark, dark room, we would switch the headlights on and that on screen is a normal um, UK beam pattern. It steps up towards the left hand side and it can step up in different ways. Sometimes it kicks up at an angle. Other times the step up is slightly more pronounced or like we've got on screen, it's called dot step. So the step, it steps up very sharply and goes across. Now, if a um, vehicle is oncoming, then of course they're kept out of the beam pattern, um, out of the, 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 the beam because of that beam pattern. Now, if I'm driving in a country lane, I can't go to main beam because that vehicle will become blinded. But with the introduction of ADAS, the camera can see where the vehicle is and with what is called adaptive lighting, whether that be using LEDs or Xenon headlights, we can bend the light around the vehicle. So as the camera knows the vehicle's position, we can switch some of the LEDs and the headlights on or off, and we can cut the oncoming vehicle out of the beam pattern. And this means that we can drive on country lanes with full beam on, and the vehicle will automatically keep all of the oncoming vehicles or vehicles we're following out of the high beam. But other than that, leave the high beam on all of the time. It's an absolutely great system. It simply allows us to allow that part of the beam to be lit, but the oncoming vehicle to stay in the dark and not be blinded by our, our headlights. And this is what it looks like in practice. So on the left hand side is standard beam. And on the right hand side is adaptive high beam engaged. So the beam lights everything up, but cuts the vehicle we're following and the oncoming vehicles out of the beam pattern and to keep them in the darkness. So that's a quick overview then on the ADAS systems and all of the new features and functions that are coming to vehicles that we are now seeing more and more of within the workshop. So now we've spoken about the ADAS systems and how they operate in brief. Let's look at when we should calibrate. So as a general rule, calibration should take place for camera and radar with the given scenarios, whether there be a fault code present in the ECU, which determines that calibration is required. It may be that the windscreen or the camera is replaced. Alternatively, after you've made changes to the wheel alignment or you've adjusted the steering wheel in any way or the steering wheel sensor. So all of these are requirements for when ADAS recalibration is taking place. But what's the important thing is that we must follow the manufacturer's guidelines. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Here we have a 2018 Audi A3 and we're looking at when does the camera need calibrating. So the OE information tells us that if there's a fault code present or the windscreen or camera has been replaced, then you have to calibrate. It also says that after we've changed the wheel alignment or we've done anything that affects the body height, that is fitting wheels with a different rolling diameter or different suspension springs which have lowered the vehicle, then we must calibrate the camera on that system. The contrary to that, if we look at a 2017 Volvo, it's very much the same, but that doesn't require calibration after wheel alignment has taken place. So what we always have to do is before we advise on calibration is just double check that if that vehicle system can adapt or it does require calibration after we've completed that type of job. And we'll come back to that in a moment because some people then ask us, well, how do I know for the vehicle I'm dealing with that's in front of me or on the phone? How do I know what, what needs doing? Now, when it comes to calibration, there are one of two types of calibration. We either have a static dynamic calibration or we have a dynamic calibration. 
Static involves using a specialized frame and pattern in front of the vehicle at certain measurements. And we put that in front of the vehicle, we then use a diagnostic tool to activate the calibration process. Alternatively, we have dynamic calibration, and that is to calibrate whilst we're driving down the road. So for this, no boards are required. We activate the function in the diagnostic tool and then take the vehicle out for a drive. But what you have to be aware of is that when you are driving the vehicle, that you may have to meet certain criteria. And here's some examples for this Vauxhall Astra. The vehicle must be driven above 38 miles an hour on a straight stretch of road with stationary objects, such as other vehicles, and you need to avoid lane changing. If you can meet that criteria, the process shouldn't take any more than about five minutes. But if you drop below 38 miles an hour, the calibration is paused and then will resume when you increase speed again. And it's the same that if you're driving down the road with no objects at the side, no parked vehicles, then the process can either not be successful or it can just take a long time. Alternatively, if we look at maybe the radar on this 2019 Kia Nero, then what the technician has to do first is using a spirit level, set the radar um, vertical using the spirit level, and then drive the vehicle and follow the uh, guidance. And again, this guidance is OE guidance. So it's saying that if, the, if it's raining at the time, it's gonna make it more difficult for it to calibrate. And again, this vehicle takes around 10 to 15 minutes. Now we mentioned really about why do we have to calibrate and one of the things that came up was wheel alignment. So the camera and radar are all set off the rear axle and we call this the thrust line. So the blue line represents a straight line through the center of the body and the red line represents the angle of the rear wheels, the angle of the toe. Now in a perfect world, the toe would always be exactly in line with the thrust angle. But actually in the real world, vehicles are made to tolerances and it may not, I mean, this one on, on screen is slightly exaggerated to, to show you, but generally it will have a slight thrust angle to the, to, to the geometry setup. So we adjust, we set the position of the board to uh, the angle of the thrust line and we set everything off the rear wheels. So what that means is that if you're making small adjustments to the vehicle's toe at the front, Providing the steering rack and, and wheel is straight, you shouldn't have any problems and it shouldn't require calibration. Again, always just check with the manufacturer's guidance. Now, the question we may ask is, well, if I get a vehicle in, then how do I actually know? Well, I can show you an example here on this, um, on this Mercedes. So in front of us, we've got a Mercedes C-Class. We've entered the registration number uh, and this is the Delphi Technologies Diagnostic Software. We can um, enter the vehicle registration number in there. That will then return the VIN and the VIN will be used to populate the vehicle details. You'll notice that then there is a category called ADAS. So first step is I know on this Mercedes C-Class, it, it may have the following ADAS systems fitted to it. It can have brake assist, multifunction camera and parking distance, which is um, your ultrasonic sensors, your parking sensors. So this year, this vehicle at this year may have one of those three systems fitted. So if you're booking a vehicle in for a wheel alignment job or, or, an, or another job that may require it, it's a great way to have an initial conversation with the customer to make them A, aware that they have ADAS and B, aware that the system may need calibration following the, the work you've completed. So in the green box, the systems that may be fitted to that vehicle. Now, the great thing is, um, if you are able to click the I button in our software, what that will do is it will look at that system and it will give you a help file and it will give you for that exact vehicle all of the requirements when ADAS calibration is, is required to be completed. So, for example, on this 2016 Mercedes, we have to calibrate if the fault codes stored in the vehicle memory, if the control unit has been replaced or you've changed the windscreen, Importantly there, the rear axle towing has been set. So if you've done four wheel geometry and you've, manip and you've modified the rear axle tow, then that vehicle will require a calibration. Alternatively, if you fitted different suspension springs that adjust the height of the vehicle from its factory height, again, it's going to be uh, required to have a calibration. So it's a great way of having that introductory in, um, conversation with the customer 
rather than completing the task and maybe realizing after that we need to add ADAS to the job. Uh, and therefore, it's maybe a cost that the customer isn't expecting. So now we've looked at the ADAS system, we've looked at the um, when do we require an ADAS calibration. Let's have a look at a little look at what evidence is required. So let's assume that you've identified the vehicle does need an ADAS calibration following the work. Then we'll look at what evidence is required. Well, the Thatcham Code of Conduct, which is most workshops and insurance companies are adhering to at the moment, gives about six or seven guidelines. And I've picked out four sort of very important ones. The first one is that the calibration must be completed by somebody who is competent. Now, proving competence is, is dif difficult. The easiest way to do that is with an, a qualification of some kind. So it's easier to have people qualified with ADAS, and then when they're carrying that out, that's the competency side covered. You must certify that the evidence and the, the calibration is within the operating um, parameters of the manufacturer's tolerance. You must also follow the instructions and equipment and have the equipment of the same standard. When And you should do it when you're making any geometry changes or anything, as we've discussed, that affects the ride height of the vehicle. And you've got to be able to produce auditable records and you've got to maintain them. So if there is an issue with that vehicle at a later date, you have to say, I have calibrated the vehicle following OE manufacturer's guidelines. The person that did it was competent and I can prove it and I have the record of that. And if you can do all of those, you're in a good position. Now we talked about qualifications. The IMI and Delphi Technologies at the Protec Academy offer IMI accreditation on ADAS. So it gives the technician a, an accreditation which lasts three years from the date they pass and it gives them a card like this with an IMI number. And what that means is when you do produce a calibration certificate, which is your evidence, you record the, num the IMI number, the accreditation number of that person on the job card and that covers the competency. And that's an example of what the card looks like uh, and that's what they get. When we print off the calibration certificate, the certificate must say that the operation has succeeded um, and ideally says what system that you're in. So with the Delphi Technologies ADAS software, this is how it looks. And it actually has even been updated since I recorded it, um, since I took this screenshot. Um, it's had some minor updates to it just to make it a little bit more user friendly. But you can see that we've done this on this 2019 Nissan Leaf. It shows that we've gone into the camera where it says calibrating camera ACS cars and ACS cars is the equipment that we use. And it's clearly showed on the in the red box that the operation has succeeded. It then gives a position for the mechanic to sign and put their IMI number in and then tell us if you need a road test after. And that road test is just to ensure that the system works and it isn't producing any errors on driving. So for most of the time, on a, if you're doing a dynamic calibration, that's one that you're driving on the road, the vehicle, of course, isn't going to need a road test. If you're doing a static calibration, um, you may advise either the customer or ideally the technician just to give it a couple of minutes road test just to make sure there are no errors and that the vehicle has been calibrated correctly and the functions are actually working. It's also a really good idea to keep a copy of the instructions and all of the figures that have been used. So you'll notice here that on the calibration certificates um, towards the bottom left hand side, um, there are some numbers and it says 685. And then on the top of the page towards the right, it'll say 685 again. These are the wheel arch height values that the technician entered. So the technician has to measure the wheel arch height and input the values in. So if they do it wrong, it's a user error. All of that information is recorded um, as well. But it's a good idea to have the instructions. So it may be, and manufacturers don't get everything right all the time, it may be a misprint in the manual that, that gives the wrong value. So by printing off the instructions at the time, you can at least prove that you follow the OE specification, which you were given at the time. So what we would do is we'd supply a copy of the calibration certificate to the customer. We'd keep a copy of the calibration certificate and we'd also keep a copy of the instructions at the time um, as part of our auditable records. And that just keeps us covered um, all the way. 
So we've discussed all those things. So what about if the customer is unsure of, you know, if they don't calibrate, well, what's going to happen? Well, you might find that the customer comes to you possibly with a few different sort of queries, um, stuff that you may not have associated with the ADAS system before. If we look at the top left one, we, the customer may moan after, if you don't calibrate the ADAS system when required, that the vehicle feels like it's pulling. Now, today, if somebody came to us and said, uh, they brought their car to us and said the vehicle is pulling, we'd initially be thinking about, well, are the tires okay, are the pressures okay? Maybe the wheel alignment isn't correct. But actually, you might find it's the adaptive lane guidance trying to pull the vehicle over because the camera isn't aligned correctly. And where the, where the actual centre of the road is, is not where the camera thinks the centre of the road is. So that's something to think about. One of the big things they may notice is if the adaptive headlights are engaged, if the camera isn't calibrated correctly again, that the headlights aren't pointing, they're not cutting out the vehicles in front of it, they may be cutting out half the vehicle and the other half of the vehicle is in the main beam. And again, the adaptive headlights work because the, the ADAS system looks through the camera and knows where the vehicles are ahead. Incorrect calibration means incorrect operation of the headlights. On the bottom, it may be that the radar being not being calibrated is means that the emergency braking either doesn't recognize a vehicle or it gives false alerts. Now I want us to consider what that might look like. So if we consider that we're the vehicle at the back and there is a vehicle turning right in the lane ahead of us. Now the red line represents the center of our vehicle and possibly where the center of the radar is as well. Although not all radars are in the center on the front. Some of them are offset to the side. Now as we're approaching this vehicle, it may be that the our vehicle chooses to ignore the vehicle in front and that's because it can't differentiate it from being a parked car or a car stopped at the traffic lights. So if it didn't ignore it at this, this stage, then it would constantly give us false alerts all the time. This is where we can, where vehicles have radar and camera, the camera can take a better look at things and it can almost cross check with the radar about what's going on. But if the radar was calibrated incorrectly, it may think, and it was, it was set at a slight angle. It may think that that vehicle is ahead, directly ahead of you, and it may be a parked vehicle. And as you approach that vehicle, the, your car slams the brakes on without you expecting it to. So it's really, really important that the, cam, the radar is calibrated correctly and following the manufacturer specifications to either stop false alerts, stop the car from braking, or it may just ignore the vehicle completely because the radar isn't quite looking at the right place. It may be that you've got faults on the dashboard or faults on the diagnostic tool showing that the aiming is complete or there is an issue uh, with that vehicle and with that ADAS system. So when it comes to ADAS, the message to customers should be a simple one. In order for me to guarantee the safety systems on your vehicle continue to work the way they were designed, then we have to follow the manufacturer's guidance and we calibrate where is required. Thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you soon on the next training video.